My name is Rico Wright. I'm receiving uh, the Doctor of Education in Mathematics Education. Growing up in North Tulsa, which is considered one of the most impoverished areas in all of Oklahoma. Uh, so we grew up poor by American standards. Uh, my mother was at first a hairstylist, uh, but due to her health problems, she had a hard time continuously working. And my stepfather was a disabled veteran uh, from the Air Force. So fortunately, we had a steady income due to that. Uh, so we, we were able to make ends meet, but I would actually admit that we were considered poor and so we, we struggled a lot uh, here and there. But the moral support of the family is what I think was the most important thing for us. Uh, and that is what carried me in particular on to go as far as I've gone. Having graduated from high school, uh, I spent the, 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 the following summer practicing you know, my basketball skills because I wanted to make it somehow in the NBA. And so in August 1999, I matriculated to Langston University, uh, which is in Langston, Oklahoma. And it was in my freshman year that I not only tried out for the basketball team and did not make it, but also became a leader uh, and scholar in my own right. And I encountered uh, Dr. Ernest L. Holloway, uh, the then president of Langston University. And I still remember at homecoming in October of that, uh, of that year, uh, my mother was on campus and uh, she was video recording a lot of what was going on because it was a high energy uh, event. And he stumbled upon us and uh, she had asked him a question about me. She said, uh, do, you know, do you know this fellow? And he says, yes, uh, this is one of our rising stars. I'm expecting a lot from him. So when he graduates from Langston and goes on farther, I would say that's what I expected of him. I would be proud of him, but that is what I expect of him. And it was at that moment that I realized that people truly had faith in whatever abilities they had seen in me. And that really gave me hope. It, it gave me what I needed to press on. And that I owed it to not only myself, but also them. Uh, because whatever they believed in me was for a greater purpose. And it was, just, it was important for me to realize what that greater purpose was. And so working in the president's office, seeing Dr. Holloway's leadership style, just really instilled in me that it's possible for me to become somebody just like him. In other words, somebody who is that impactful, somebody who is that influential, but with meaning, with purpose. And growing up, I didn't have doctors in the community. I didn't even know how one could obtain a doctorate. In fact, when you hear somebody say doctor something, you think medical doctor. You don't think that there are these various other kinds of doctors. And anyway, having been exposed to a lot by virtue of traveling with Dr. Holloway and just being around him, I just got to see that there's a, there's, there's a hope for me in higher education. And that's, that's why I set out to attend graduate school and to pr pursue a doctorate in order to basically prepare myself for a life in academia. It wasn't until 2007 uh, that I came across a text by Plato. Uh, I remember reading uh, early on Plato's Mino, and it was a very, very brief dialogue. It was something in class that we had mentioned very briefly, but uh, I then started to read some of the other Socratic dialogues written by Plato. And I was really fascinated at the way in which Plato would leave a question hanging by the end of the text. In a way, I was sort of waiting for him to tell me, say, what virtue is, or what beauty is, um, or what justice is, but he never gave me the answer. He always had Socrates sort of allude to what the answer is, or perhaps what some possibilities for answers are, but he never gave the answer to me. In fact, it seemed as if he was saying to me, well, what is your answer? And so there I was left at the end of the text, just pondering what these things were in themselves. And I then started to encounter philosophers talking about mathematics, using mathematics as examples, talking about the substance of mathematics. And I was really impressed by this because here I was going more into philosophy but returning to mathematics. And the thing that they all sort of focused on um, was the logic. And that seemed to be, to me, the intersection of mathematics and philosophy. And I would have to say that uh, Dr. Pollock was the one who allowed me to see how I could use both mathematics and philosophy 
uh, as, as a way to talk about a kind of mathematical thinking. But Dr. Pollock was never interested in giving us the answer as much as he was interested in how we arrived at that answer. And then another aspect to his teaching was that he wanted to show us the various ways in which we could teach mathematics. And in 2009, I traveled to Australia with the mathematics program here at Teachers College. And I was having a discussion with the, the group uh, chaperone, as it were. Uh, and he was asking me about my research interests and I was telling him these ideas. And then he said, well, my colleagues and I are doing something that's quite similar to that. We're, we're calling it relational thinking in mathematics. Uh, but we're focusing on just arithmetic and we're thinking about algebraic reasoning and arithmetic. As I got deep into the literature review, I realized well, what these mathematics education researchers had really done was relational thinking in, in arithmetic. But I wanted to know, could there be a relational thinking in mathematics that encompassed all subjects of mathematics? Arithmetic, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, calculus, and so on. And so in other words, I wanted to give a sort of general definition but a mathematical definition of what relational thinking is. And so I define relational thinking in mathematics as basically the ability to make connections between and among the general mathematical concepts and the specific instances thereof. Because in mathematics, we typically have a specific example that we use as a way to arrive at the general concept. But sometimes one can learn the general concept and do various other specific particular examples. Relational thinking comes into play when a student is actually able to see that, hey, 99 times 5 is the same as 100 times 5 minus 5. And that actually might be easier for students to actually do because 500 minus 5 is much easier than thinking of what 99 times 5 is. But the key part of this with respect to relational thinking in mathematics is to, to, to allow the student to see that there is a truth in this solution because there's a distributive property that holds for it. Mind you, the student may not even be exposed to the distributive property as yet, but this, this kind of thinking that sort of promotes an understanding that suggests that later on that the student would be more advanced given that this kind of thinking is already happening. If the goal is to help students to appreciate mathematics, um, then I think there's something to be said about how they first and foremost think about mathematics. And so the question is, are students truly thinking about and in mathematics? And so relational thinking seems to promote that there is a much more efficient way of thinking about these things to the point where students would be in awe. They'd have their own eureka moments. And they can also claim ownership of having thought in this way. I mean, for many years, we didn't even know what zero was as a mathematical concept. Nowadays, we take it for granted. Um, before Pythagoras, we, we didn't have you know the a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or the idea of finding what that diagonal is. And for, for a long time, you know, people were just puzzled by these thoughts. Well, students encounter mathematics in the exact same way. They're still puzzled by these things, but it's when they arrive at some of these conclusions on their own, when they actually sort of claim ownership of a thought, that that becomes personal to them. And on the other hand, I would say some students who get things wrong when they expect it to get it right, they learn in that way as well. Um, but in the end, if we could help students to appreciate mathematics by way of just merely encouraging them to think about it, and I think we're getting somewhere, because then students won't have the same kind of math anxiety that they've been having. They don't see that all about them, even if they're looking at architecture, it's mathematics. They're looking at a lot of the, you know, the, the science and nature. There's, there's mathematics even in all of that. But they can't always see. And that's why I think relational thinking is important, is important because relational thinking focuses on, one, making the connections. And these connections are, I think, everywhere present. I remember a couple of months ago uh, being in Tulsa, and I had to actually find out what the graduation date this year was. And so there I was online trying to find the uh, graduation date such that I can inform my family of when the graduation would be. And May 21st, 
coincidentally happened to be the date. And I said to myself, that, that date sounds familiar to me, you know. And that's when it dawned on me that that was the, the, the very date that my mother passed on. And all I could think about was the fact that I had promised my mother that I would dedicate my doctorate to her. This is while she was alive. Um, because it was because of her. It was because of her hard work and her moral support and her guidance that allowed me to get to this point in my, in my education. And I just couldn't hold back the tears in that very moment. It was just surreal that the dates would align in such a way. And she very much wanted to be here, and I believe that she will be here in, in some way or another. Um, but I, I now consider that day to be even more special because it's, it's a day full of celebrations. I'll be going back to Langston University uh, as assistant professor of mathematics. I like the way in which I am going back because I've always said to myself that I wanted to give back in a meaningful way. I wanted my life to be representative of something meaningful. And I think this is the very opportunity for me to not only give back, but to also give meaning to all of the things that I've been exposed to, um, all of the different people who have contributed to my life. Um, it could be a way of my saying thank you to them for allowing me to learn from them and to now give to others who are in need of learning and who desire to learn. And that is to just share with students what opportunities they have, you know, that they don't have to even stay in Oklahoma. They could venture out and see the world and become what they want to be, especially if they think about my own trajectory. You know, I was probably the, the least likely of individuals to go this far. And so I can say to the, uh, to the youth entering college, hey, you too can achieve. And it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, as quickly as the next person. You might want to take your time, but the fact is that you do it. And I think for a lot of people, that will provide a lot of hope for them. And I'm looking forward to what the future holds there.